Crossbridge, thanks so much for joining us today. We're excited to connect with you. So be sure to say hi in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Our outreach ministry, CB Local, is hosting a food drive to benefit King's Things and your place at the table. Sign up to distribute flyers to your neighbors, then pick up their food from their porches. Click the link in the description for more information and sign up today to safely love our community. At Crossbridge, we are all about loving God, loving people, and serving the world. If you want to give to help further that mission and reach more people with the gospel, you can go to crossbridgecc.org slash give. Well, service is about to begin. We hope that you're encouraged today and find yourself taking one step forward in your faith.
Jesus, we just thank you for who you are. May we worship you in this place today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Crossbridge family, and welcome to Crossbridge Online. It is so good to be with you this morning, and it is a pleasure to have you, especially if you're a guest with us. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us wherever you find yourself today. My hope for you is the same as it is for every single person who calls Crossbridge their home, and it's simply this. No matter where you are today, my hope and my prayer is you would take one step towards Jesus because that is is what we are all about here at Crossbridge. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And you've joined us at a great time because we're in week two of a five-week series that we are calling Attitude Check. This moment when we stop and look at our own lives and realize that our heart oftentimes needs to be brought into check because we've got some issues. And so we're stopping to look at our attitudes and our heart to see, are things lining up? Last week, we talked a lot about how our heart could use a check, our attitude could use a check when it comes to waiting. Many of us are not patient people or good waiters. I'm not that way, so having conversations with you this week has been unbelievably encouraging. For those of you who took the challenge and we gave you that list of 10 things to choose from, Many of you dove into that and you're like, three days was enough for me. I was exhausted. I didn't want to drive speed limit anymore. I, I didn't want to walk slower, but I tried. And you felt that same pressure and uh, almost a little bit of anxiety of what's going on that I felt. And so thanks for taking that challenge and I hope it reveals to you this beauty of slowing down. Today we're gonna switch gears though. We're gonna move from this idea of the pace of our life being so hurried that we don't know how to wait. And instead we're going to stop and not just think about how we're living, but think about the words that we're using. The words that we're using because they will reveal to us about if we're men or women who can be considered a man or a woman of their word. You know, it's funny, words are so important. And recently I found myself agitated. I would even use maybe the word allergic to a specific word that's been coming up. And it's just started to frustrate me. And that word is technically. Okay, technically. Uh, you know this word and it, it gets used all the time. Have you ever been in a conversation, family, friend, coworker, and this word is used? Normally it's used to kind of relieve responsibility from ourselves if we end up using it, or it's used to get out of a situation or to kind of justify a reason we didn't follow through with some project or that we did just enough in that project when we knew what was behind it. Um, please tell me I'm not alone on this one. If you're around someone who uses this word all the time, you could just go ahead and look at them if they're on the couch, because they know. Technically, they use the word all the time, right? I, I don't know, but have you ever felt that pressure where technically starts to make you want to punch someone? It drives me nuts. Have you ever asked someone to do a job? Maybe it's, it's something as silly as like, can you empty the dishwasher? And it's like, sure, I'll empty the dishwasher. And it does get emptied, but it's just all over the countertops. It's not put away. Now we know when we say, can you empty the dishwasher? We're asking whomever that is to agree to taking what's in the dishwasher out and putting it into the cabinets. To put it on the countertop, technically, is emptying the dishwasher, isn't it? But it's not the heart behind it. Have you ever been in a meeting with your coworkers at your business and someone is tasked with following up, maybe it's even you, you've been tasked with following up with a customer and saying, you know, how did this experience go or whatever, you needed to do this. And you know that by your next meeting, you're gonna get asked about it, but you forgot. And so 10 minutes before your meeting, you're like, oh, I need to call. And so you make the call, you leave the message because you know they're not there. And you go into your meeting and when your boss or fellow coworkers say, did you follow up? You could say, yeah, I followed up. Because technically you did. And when they say, how did that conversation go? You can say, well, I reached out. I just haven't heard back yet. I'm still waiting to hear back. But we leave out the truth that it's like, I, I called before I was running in on my cell phone. I, it's, sorry, because 
technically, we got out of it. You know, most of us technically use that word all the time to get away from the responsibility. We, if we're being honest, understand the heart behind the deals that we make, don't we? The promises that we make to our spouses, to our parents, to our siblings, our friends, our coworkers. We know the heart behind the deals we're making, but too often I believe we're looking for technicalities to get out. And so my question for you this morning, the attitude check for you and for me is simply this. Are you a man or a woman of your word? Or are you the king or queen of technically? Because that shows a lot about our heart. And I believe that God wants us to be men and women of our word, not looking to technically get out of anything, but to follow through with the real heart behind the promises and deals that we make. You know, in this series, we have been looking through the life of David, specifically in 2 Samuel together, and that's what we've been soaping together. And if you um, have your Bibles, I'm actually going to have you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 20. Um, but tomorrow, you're going to jump into 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we're going to spend some time there too today. But for the start of our time looking at King David's life, I want to go back to something we've soaped before in 1 Samuel 20. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn there? It'll be in the first couple of uh, books of your Bible. And then if you don't know where to go, feel free to use the table of contents and know that we're going to have it up on the screen in just a second. But as you approach this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 20, here's what I need you to understand. Many of you know that King David at this point in 1 Samuel is not king yet. And there comes this time that this is post him making these major moves in his life to kill Goliath, already being anointed king, but not being that. He's come into King Saul's service, the first king of Israel, and he has served Saul very, very faithfully. He's been so loyal. And Saul's son, Jonathan, who's also an amazing warrior, has become the closest of friends with David. They have this relationship that is so deep, that is so intimate, that is so loving with each other that they know at all times, they've got my back. If a fight were to start, you know the other would show up to defend. They would be behind each other 100%. And there comes this moment moving into 1 Samuel 20 where David goes to Jonathan and he says to Jonathan, listen, I got to give you a heads up. Your dad hates me. And Jonathan's like, he, he doesn't hate you. I mean, if he hated, hated you, he would tell me. I mean, I knew he threw a spear at you that time, but maybe you yeah, had a little bit, you know, it was a little off. It's not as bad as you think. And David's like, no, I'm telling you, he knows how tight we are. He knows that we're so close. And because we're so close, he's not going to tell you how much he hates me. Your dad wants to kill me. He's going to kill me. Jonathan says, no, no, M maybe, oh no. Well, I'll tell you what, if he does, I'm going to figure it out for you. I'll make you a deal. And they begin to strike up a deal. Are you ready for this? If you have your Bibles, I want you to jump 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're going to go to verse 10 and it says this. Then David asked, how will I know whether or not your father is angry? Come out to the field with me, Jonathan replied. And they went out there together. And Jonathan told David, I promise by the Lord, the God of Israel, that by this time tomorrow or the next day at the latest, I will talk to my father and let you know at once how he feels about you. If he speaks favorably about you, I'll let you know. But if he is angry and wants you killed, may the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so that you can escape and live. May the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father. And may you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this same faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a solemn pact with David saying, may the Lord destroy all your enemies. And Jonathan 
May David reaffirm his vow of friendship again, for Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. Now, when you pick this up at this point, what you get is this beautiful story where Jonathan starts to make a promise to David. And he says, David, I'm gonna figure out by tomorrow or the next day at the latest. He's putting a time frame on his promise, right? He's gotta come through within the next 24 to 48 hours. And he says, I'm gonna make a deal. I'm gonna go find out what my dad really thinks about you. David says, what, what am I supposed to do with this? And he goes, no, I'm gonna figure it out. And if he's out to kill you, I will tell you so that you can get out of here. I'm not gonna hide anything from you. I need you to be safe. I'm, I make you that promise, 24 to 48 hours. But you need to make a promise to me. As I bless you and hope that God is with you as he was with my dad, please remember me. Remember me and remember my family, even when all your enemies are gone and no one wants to fight you anymore. Because that day will come. Would you remember my family because you'll be king? He knows it. And he says, would you make this promise? There's three things about Jonathan here that we need to pick up when it comes to making promises or being men or women of our word. He was very serious, very serious about the conversation. This wasn't a throwaway, yeah, yeah, I promise I'll do it. No, no, no. He understood what he was doing. He knew that this was possibly going to cost him his life. If Jonathan starts to dig a little bit for information about David and Saul gets angry, Saul could very realistically kill Jonathan because he's an ally. He knows that he may lose his life over this. And so because of that, he thinks about the future of his family. He took all accounts and made a deal that even could cost him his life. And at this point, Jonathan goes back and he has dinner with his family and his dad haphazardly asks where David went and Jonathan gives him a story about him going to do sacrifices and whatever. And, and you know, over this small series of events, Saul begins to freak out. Saul freaks out on Jonathan and he's like, I knew you were his friend. I knew you're covering for him. And, and he blows it up. And Jonathan's like, yeah, I think my dad doesn't like him. I think he wants to kill him. He has an option at this point. Shut his mouth. Let the king do what he wants to do and take the throne. Or he could be a man of his word, a man of integrity, a man who follows through with what he said and tell David. And so they hatched this little plan about how they would tell each other what was going on that involved shooting arrows in this field. And it ends up being Jonathan goes out, shoots the arrow, has the, some of these kids go get them, brings them back and uses the code to let David know, it is all over. My dad's out to kill you. Check out how this story ends in 1 Samuel chapter 20. If you could jump to verse 41 with me, it says this. As soon as the boy was gone, who was fetching these arrows, David came out from where he'd been hiding near the stone pile. And then David bowed three times to Jonathan with his face to the ground, and both of them were in tears as they embraced each other, and they said goodbye, especially David. At last, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn loyalty to each other in the Lord's name. The Lord is the witness of a bond between us, and our children forever. And then David left and Jonathan returned to the town. This right here is the end of an era. This right here is two friends who loved each other so much that knew this moment could very well be the last moment they ever have together. And they wear the weight through their tears, through hugging each other, and then reminding each other that God has brought us together, but our families and our children will be brought together. They will be like family. This is the moment when David goes his way, Jonathan goes his, and they will never see each other again. This is it. Saul will pursue David for years after this moment. Jonathan will live his life the way that he can. Saul will go into battle against the Philistines at the end of this book. 
and he will die along with his entire family, including Jonathan and two of his brothers. And the one brother is kind of a dirtbag takes over the throne, Isbosheth. And there becomes civil war with David and Isbosheth and, and who gets to rule over Israel. And from this moment of David and Jonathan splitting, we've got about 12 years of time, 12 years of time before David becomes the king of all Israel. And after 12 years of a, a promise made 12 years ago, are you, do you really have to be accountable for a promise 12 years ago that the guy you made it with is dead and now no one was around to know that you made the promise? Do you really need to follow through with that? What does David do? This is what we're going to read about tomorrow. So I'm going to give you this great head start. Are you ready? Let's jump. 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. One day David asked, and he's looking at all his leaders around, and he says, Is there anyone in Saul's family that's still alive? Anyone whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. It's been 12 years, 12 years, and now things have settled for David. He's king over everything, and the first thing he's thinking when he's on the throne over all of Israel isn't about consolidating power, isn't about eliminating anybody who could have been coming for the throne. It's about a promise made to a best friend 12 years ago that he knows he's accountable for. Is there anyone from Saul's family? anyone from Saul's family that I can be generous to, that I can be kind to. What kind of man is David? David, right here, is a man of his word. Let's actually look at this whole passage. Um, we'll just read most of the chapter because it is so good. It says, one day David asked, is there anyone in Saul's family still alive? anyone that I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. He summoned a man named Ziba who had been one of Saul's servants. And he said, are you Ziba? Yes, sir, I am. And then the king asked him, is there anyone still alive from Saul's family so I can show kindness to them? And Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. One of Jonathan's sons, David's never met him. This is a son that was born when David was on the run. He had no idea this guy existed. David's probably thinking, jackpot, I hit the jackpot. It's one of Jonathan's sons. And so in verse four, it's not like, oh, where is he? The king replied. This is, where is he? The king asked. And lo to bar, Ziba told him, at the home of Machir, son of Emiliel. So David sent for him and brought him from Machir's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, Greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant? Basically saying, Who am I that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? And then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and he said, Listen, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. And you and your sons and your servants, you're going to farm this land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, he will eat here at my table. From that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. When you look at this, we have a story where David was a man of his word. He followed through on what he had to do technically could have gotten out of all this, right? Technically, when he found out that Mephibosheth, it's a great name, isn't it? Can we just stop for a second and say Mephibosheth? Turn to the people on your left and the right. Give them a, a Mephibosheth. Just feels good, doesn't it? David technically could have gotten out of this. 
Technically, when he found out that Mephibosheth couldn't walk, he could have said, well, the Levitical law and all these things talk so much about those who are lame that there's, they're, they're like unclean, so they need to be out of the city. He can't be in my city. He can't be one of the holy people. He's broken is what they would consider at this point. You see, the reason that his legs were broken is when that whole war happened and his dad was killed, his aide took him and scooped him in his arms and ran away ran away and when they were running away the the aid the servant tripped and when they tripped Mephibosheth fell broke his legs and they were never able to recover it wasn't even his fault well technically it doesn't matter you could get out of that technically your dad didn't really save me because I had to go on the run and his dad still tried to kill me. So technically, he, he didn't really do all that he promised he was gonna do. Technically, I could be nice to you, but you could stay home. You could stay in your little town and I can make sure that you have food. I could technically make sure that I follow through on my promise of taking care of you. Technically. Technically, we all know that's a bunch of garbage, don't we? Technically, we all know that when David and Jonathan wept together, there was something so beautiful about their children growing up together that David and Jonathan longed. The heart behind their promises is we will bless each other. We will do all we can to be there for each other, to build each other up, to make sure these families grow old together. And so in verse 7, when it says, when David says, don't be afraid, it's so important. In verse 7, let me reread that for you. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. Why would he tell him not to be afraid? Why? Because here's the thing. Mephibosheth was called from his town to be in front of the king, and he stands in front of the king at this point, in a monarchy, which is what we're dealing with here, when a king were to take over power, what do all the other kings do in all the other cities? They eliminate any rival people, anyone who could come for the throne. Mephibosheth probably thinks he's being brought to the palace to be killed. That's why he's being... And so he lays himself and says, what can I do? I am your servant. David's like, no, 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 no. You, you got this all wrong. This is completely backwards because your dad, your dad was my best friend and I promised him everything. And now that I have you, I'm going to give you back everything that was taken from you. Everything that was removed from you. When you ran, all that land is yours again. Your grandfather earned that land. It's his land and I'm going to honor Saul and I'm going to honor Jonathan by meeting the heart of the promise that we made. I will go beyond a technicality. And the heart behind it was generosity to do all that he could. And that's where he met him. We made an agreement, your dad and I. We made a pact. We made a vow. And I will follow through. And so today, I want to stop and ask this morning with our attitude checks. When you look at your own heart right now in this moment, what does it look like? Is it one that all people would look at and say, man, when they say, yes, they mean it. That's a woman of her word. That man completes everything he says he's going to do. Or are you one who looks for technicalities? You look for excuses to get out of what you've agreed on. I know that's really hard because we live in a culture of deception. And you may think, oh, that's great that David was that way. He was a man after God's own heart, whatever. Listen, he lied. He made mistakes. But he followed through on his promises as well. And this isn't just a David thing, a King David thing. This is a Jesus Christ thing. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, from this very line of David, cared about this. 
He cared about what we say. In his very famous Sermon on the Mount, which is in Matthew chapter 5, and if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn there. Um, the biography of Jesus written by Matthew will be the first book in the New Testament, so probably about three quarters of the way through your Bible. And from chapters 5, 6, and 7, it's his Sermon on the Mount, which is one of the most amazing three chapters in Scripture where you get this summary of all the ideologies, the teachings, the values that Jesus has. And as disciples of Jesus, as his apprentices, we have to look at this and, and not just say, oh, that seems like some good moral teaching. We have to look at this and say, am I actually living out what's said here? Right? There's no choice in any of this. And we're going to deep dive this when it comes into uh, September. We're going to really have some fun in Matthew. So I hope that when you get together in your small groups and unpack all these things with Jesus, um, man, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. If you jump into chapter 5, Jesus says, starting in verse 33, he says this, You have also heard that our ancestors were told you must not break your vows, you must carry out the vows that you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say, by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say, by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say, by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say, by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. I love this. Jesus starts to press in on this idea of making vows and promises to the people of this area because, let's just be honest, most were untrustworthy. Many of the Jewish teachers of this time, they knew the law inside and out. They knew the 600 plus laws that they have all agreed to as a Jewish nation. They knew when they made promises to each other that there were technicalities. They had become ex experts. And technically, we could figure out a way around the Sabbath. We could figure out a way around adultery. We could figure out a way around slavery. We could figure out a way around, around, around. And they were so good at getting around the rules. And then, because of that, what happens when you begin to see people break their word over and over or technically complete it, but you know they're not meeting the heart behind it? You lose trust in them, don't you? And so the Jewish nation had lost trust in their leaders because technically they, they could get out of anything. Stop for a second. We know this in our culture, don't we? We know this so well. I don't care what side of any political party you are on right now. If you look at the government as a whole, in any way, shape, or form, how many of our politicians would we say, these are men and these are women of their word? When they say they're going to do something, they follow through all the time with what they say they're going to do. How many times in the next 80 whatever days until November are we going to hear promises and vows from people running for office that we're going to stop and say they're never going to do that? They're never going to be able to complete that. But we're going to sit here and say, they're making promises, they're making vows. This is what I'm going to do for you. And we buy into what they're going to do. The problem is, they're not men and women of their word. They're not going to do it. They're false promises. And what Jesus is saying here is like, listen, you have gotten into the habit of making promises that you can't keep. And now because you can't keep them, you swear that you're gonna be able to do it. I swear to God that I will follow through with this. Oh, you know, as God is my witness, I will do this. Why do you have to swear on God? Why does Jesus Christ have to be a name that you have to hang your promise on? Is your word not good enough? Why do we have to say, and this is so wild, right? As, as kids, do you remember when kids were like, I swear on my grandmother's grave, uh, why? Is your word not good enough? Is the character of your life and the way that you live, do you live in such a way that the words that you speak mean nothing? You know, in one of my favorite movies from the 80s, 
there's a great scene and I don't know if you have seen the movie The Princess Bride but uh, it's a regular in my home and there's a moment that as I read through what Jesus says here I think about David and the promises that people make it really comes into play and there is this one scene where the dread pirate Roberts and if you haven't seen the movie spoiler I don't even feel bad ready you, you should have seen it already it's like 30 years old 40 years old it's old the Dread Pirate Roberts is climbing the cliffs of insanity. And he's already been beaten up there by a, a traveling bandits who are trying to get away. And they leave Inigo Montoya, the Spanish fencer at the top, to kill the Dread Pirate Roberts when he finally finishes climbing the cliffs. As he's almost to the top, Inigo Montoya looks over. And as he looks over the top, he says, I, I, I don't suppose that you could hurry it up so that I could kill you. And the Dread Pirate Robert says, you know, I really would love to, but I need to be careful. You know, it's, it's a hard climb. And he says, well, is there anything that I could do to hurry you up? And he says, unless you're willing to throw me down a rope, I don't really think so. And he says, well, if I threw you down a rope, would you really take it? He says, probably not. And Inigo Batoya looks at him, he says, what if I gave you my word as a Spaniard? And the Dread Pirate Roberts looks up and he says, Nope, no good. I've known too many Spaniards. And he goes, ah. And he leans over the cliffs. And he says, I give you my word. I swear on the soul of my father, Domingo Montoya, that you will reach the top alive. And the dread pirate Robert says, throw me the rope. He had to swear on something that was so important to him in order to be believed by a pirate. It sounds so dumb in this exchange, but here's my question. If we were to replace some of these words from this clip, and our culture as a whole right now, which are climbing the cliffs of insanity, they're climbing at a pace that's not right, they're too hurried. They don't know how to slow down. They're overwhelmed by finances and stress and all of these things and they don't understand the hope of Jesus and they're stuck on here trying to climb with no end in sight and we lean over the cliff and we say, I I'm willing to help and they're like, nope. What if we were to say, but I give you my word as a Christian. I give you my word as a disciple of Jesus that you'll make it up here if you let me help you. Can I tell you and be completely honest, my biggest fear is that so many would say, no, I've known too many Christians. None of you keep your word. I know people who say they believe what you believe and they have burned me over and over. I've seen you promise to do things. I wouldn't trust you at all. I worry, I worry that too many of us have made compromises from the promises that we've made, that we have not followed through on what we said we were going to do, to love like God calls us to love, to give like God's called us to give, and the lives that we live look so unlike the life of Jesus Christ that if we lean over and say, I know someone who I'm dedicating my life to, who gave his life for me. I will reach over and give my life for you, like Jonathan to David, like Jesus to us. Too many climbing the cliffs of insanity at this moment. Your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers would look and say, but you don't look anything like that, Jesus. I can't trust your words. I worry this is what too many of us have leaned into and have walked into. Jesus' words in verse 37. You're gonna make these promises, you're gonna make these vows. You wanna be a man or a woman of your word, here's what you need to do. Matthew 5, 37. Just say a simple yes, I will. Or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Stop saying yes to things that you know you're never gonna do because you feel bad about saying no. No is not a curse word. 
no is a freedom word because when we say no to some things we can say yes to what God calls us to but too many of us make promises to all these people about things we never intend to do and we lose all credibility because our yes isn't yes and our no isn't no it gets washed away in all our promises do you want to be a man of your word a woman of your word a teen of your word Maybe you're asking, where do I start? Maybe we look at the words of Jesus. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Don't overpromise. Don't overpromise. Say what you want to do up to a point. Put some time frames on it. It'll help. Just say yes, I will, no, I won't. If you make a deal, follow through with the heart of the deal. Follow through with what you know is the intention behind the agreement that you're making. Stop looking for technically ways to get out of this. Because technically is going to become the curse word that removes the character from your heart. Technically is going to be the way that you continue to put yourself in front of others and technically will become the word that erodes your yes and your no. And maybe the hardest thing for us to do if you would call yourself a Christian, a disciple, an apprentice of Jesus is simply this. If you have broken covenants, if you have broken vows and broken promises and you know that you've technically fulfilled them but the heart behind it has never been met and you're in a place where you're like, ah, I kind of got away with it. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Go back and make things right. Go back to the people that you know you've broken these promises with and gain the credibility of letting your yes be yes again. And if you're thinking, Jimmy, like, that's dumb. That's going to cost me something. I'm going to look like an idiot. That was like, you know, a couple weeks ago or months ago or when I lied to my boss about finishing that thing and, and I got away with it. Like, it's, do I really need to go and say anything? Like, well, I, I, I'm going to say go do it. Go own up to be a man, to be a woman of integrity. For David, it was 12 years and he held his word. I dream about Crossbridge being a place filled with men, with women, with teenagers and children who keep their words, whose yeses are yes, that when our church says, I will show up, we will show up, that they would say, oh, if they say it, you could believe them because they look like Jesus and Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up when he said, I love them so much, I'll give anything. My life, fine, take it. He has shown up for us and it is our job to show up with our words and our promises for others. So this is our call for this week. Where is your heart right now? Jesus' yes was yes. And so as we move into a time of communion together, we celebrate the yes of Jesus that he gave his life for us. We celebrate the no of Jesus, that he rejected sin, that he rejected things that were put before him that he could have said yes to that would have compromised his life and instead he said no to give the best yes for you and for me. And so at this time I would love for us to move into a time of celebrating communion together. And if you have your communion elements ready, um, we're going to give you just a, a, everyone else just a couple of seconds to kind of get oriented. And what I would love for you to do is make sure that for, if you're in community right now, that all people are surrounding that table together. If you're alone right now, I just want to say that we see you, we recognize that you're here, and we know that it's difficult to celebrate communion alone because it's meant to be in community and we feel that with you. But thank you so much that you continue to do this discipline of pursuing Jesus. So let me give you a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds just to get everything ready and we'll celebrate communion together.
Thanks for joining us for communion. You know, Jesus said yes to giving up his life for us. And as we gather around tables together, we celebrate that yes, that he truly was a man of his word. And in the last week of his life at the Passover Seder that he'd be celebrating with his 12 best friends, the apostles, the disciples, um, he sat around with them during this dinner and he grabbed the loaf of bread and, and they wouldn't have understood it at the time, but he, he held it up and he said, do you see this? This is my body, which is broken for you. And he would have broken it. And so at this time, what I'd love for you to do, whatever cracker or bread or whatever your carrier is, would you take it, break it, and just listen to the snap? That was the yes of Jesus for us. And in the same way, he held up the cup at the end of Passover, which is a really important cup in the Seder, which is the cup of redemption, that all Jewish people would have understood this is about a time to come. And without understanding it, Jesus basically told them, soon this will represent my blood which when given and poured out, is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And then he asks, and, and he asks us to, to remember him every time we break bread and every time we drink this cup. And so what I would love for us to do together as a community is to remember the yeses of Jesus for you and for me. As we take our bread and we dip it in our cup and we eat, we drink, and we remember Christ together. Would you eat with me and drink with me? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your yes, Thank you for your body, your blood, broken and shed for us so that we, instead of climbing the cliffs of insanity, can be at the top of that cliff, resting in you and what you have done that we could never do for ourselves. God, I ask so deeply for your Holy Spirit to indwell us that we would look, love, and speak like Jesus, that our yeses would be yes, that our noes would be no, and that grace would abound as we begin to learn to speak, live, and love like you, Jesus. Thank you so much for the opportunity to celebrate together as a family. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Crossbridge, I love you. I miss you. And I cannot wait to see you soon. May God bless you, keep you, and may his face shine upon you. Thanks so much for connecting with us this morning at Crossbridge Online. We love that we get to be the church even when we can't physically be together. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Until then, keep up to date online at crossbridgecc.org.